So if you're like me, 2020 is a year you might be hoping to forget. COVID-19 has been on a global rampage, killing or maiming thousands and causing devastating consequences to many aspects of everyday life. So today we wanna to talk about COVID-19, not only because it is a global menace, front of mind for nearly everyone, but also because there are important parallels with Lyme disease. For example, emerging from this pandemic, there appears to be a group of individuals affected by COVID-19 with persistent health problems. It goes by different names, the condition, long COVID, or the patients, long haulers. There are four parallels with Lyme disease that have really struck me. Initially, some patients with long COVID were met with disbelief from their healthcare providers. The illness was all in their head, some were told. Secondly, many of these individuals self-organized, like the, media, the social media savvy group COVID Survivors, now with over 100,000 members, shared their stories of recovery or persistent problems and found new ways to collaborate with the research community. Third, the possible causes that underlie persistent symptoms in these COVID long haulers are very similar to persistent Lyme. Yale Im immunologist, Dr. Iwasaka, recently hypothesized three potential mechanisms for long COVID. One, reservoirs of persistent infection. Two, reservoirs of persistent viral antigens. Three, autoimmunity, whereby infection causes the immune system to turn on, on the self, resulting in ongoing inflammation. All of these will sound familiar to those in the Lyme community. Of course, there are also striking parallels in the search for effective prevention methods, vaccines, and therapies. So today, we're asking, what might our experience with Lyme disease teach us about COVID-19, or vice versa? So let me introduce our esteemed panelists. I'm joined by Dr. Richard Horowitz. He is a board-certified internist and prior member of the HHS Tick-Borne Disease Working Group. As medical director of the Hudson Valley Healing Arts Center, he's treated over 13,000 chronic Lyme patients with classical and integrative approaches, creating an effective model to address those with resistant chronic illness. And David Petrino. David is a physical therapist with a PhD in neuroscience, and he is the director of rehabilitation innovation for the Mount Sinai Health System. He runs three clinical and research centers at Mount Sinai, all with the mission of accelerating the path of novel technologies into the common clinical practice of rehabilitation medicine and human performance initiatives. So David, why don't you start us off and tell us what you've learned about long COVID? Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks for having me. Um, so, you know, I, I think that one of the first things to, to really point out, because I, I wanna make sure that all patients feel seen and heard is that not all cases of long-term issues with COVID are specifically what we, we've started to refer to as long COVID or uh, COVID long haulers, because there have been a lot of diverse long-term effects of COVID. So when we started to um, monitor the health of acutely ill COVID patients, what we started to notice was that after around six, seven weeks, a, a number of our patients, around 10 to 15%, started to exhibit symptoms of what we've, we've now come to refer to as, as long COVID. Um, and these symptoms uh, were, were very distinct from, from other long-term causes that might be related to organ damage or, or um, things of that nature. And um, uh, chief amongst the symptoms, like the, the, the most uh, roundly reported symptom was exercise intolerance and extreme fatigue. So when I, when I talk about exercise intolerance and extreme fatigue, I, I don't mean, you know, I went, I went for a run and I'm not feeling as fit as I used to. I mean, I walked up a flight of stairs and now I can't do anything for two days. I'm stuck in bed. So very, very extreme exercise intolerance, um, reports of heart palpitations, um, high heart rates, um, difficulties cog uh, concentrating, cognitive fog, um, and uh, a lot of chest pain, shortness of breath, um, and most distressingly for many of these um, individuals with long COVID, the symptoms came and went. So they would have, it, it's rather than having constant symptoms, they would have attacks of symptoms and, and things would bring them on, 
but they were hard things to predict. So it's hard to know what's going to bring on an attack of symptoms. So um, we've been tracking uh, hundreds of individuals with uh, long COVID at this point, and we've been working on uh, management strategies. And, um, you know, it has really been a collaborative, a collaborative process, not just with uh, between patients and multiple clinical providers, but also with uh, multiple members of uh, uh, chronic conditions, such as you know th this group of um, individuals for Lyme disease. Thank you, David. So, Dr. Horowitz, over to you. You have uh, a lot of experience in treating inflammation associated with Lyme disease, and so. How have these experiences translated to COVID-19? Yes, thank you, Jason. And again, thank you for having us. So in treating over 13,000 Lyme patients, the common denominator that I've seen with Lyme patients that keeps the mill is inflammation. And when I was starting to review the literature on COVID and I started to look at the inflammatory cytokines being produced, whether it's TNF-alpha, IL-1, IL-6, uh, AL-18, it reminded me of the same cytokines we're seeing with Lyme. So I decided to try the same exact methodologies we use, which is blocking a switch inside the nucleus called NF-kappa B. And we've been doing this for decades using three supplements, N-acetylcysteine, 600 milligrams twice a day, alpha-lipoic acid, anywhere between 300 to 600 twice a day, and glutathione, uh, roughly 250 to 500 twice a day. But with COVID pneumonia, and I published a study on this, efficacy of glutathione in treating dyspnea with COVID pneumonia. Uh, we published this in an SLV journal, the uh, Journal of Respiratory Medicine Case Reports. We showed that with 2,000 milligrams of glutathione, which is the same dose we use to treat Herxheimer reactions in Lyme patients, which is a cytokine effect, that within an hour, these patients would tell us that their shortness of breath got better. And we saw that a lot of these patients, their fatigue improved, their headaches improved, uh, their activities of daily living improved, taking these type of nutritional supplements. The IV may have worked a little bit better than the orals. And we also blocked inflammation with a pathway called NRF2 by stimulating it with curcumin uh, and broccoli seed extract, sulforaphane glucosinolate. So we've been using these supplements both preventatively and for treatment with vitamin C, vitamin D, melatonin, which has been shown to also lower inflammation with COVID, um, zinc, which has been shown to be deficient in Lyme patients. And we've been having great success. I've treated about 25 patients to date. And in fact, just yesterday, someone contacted me who hadn't been in my practice for 10 years. Two family members got COVID. She had seen the articles we published in the medical journals, and uh, she tried it and told me again within an hour, she had exactly the same response with high-dose glutathione. So I think that uh, we can learn from patients with Lyme disease that uh, the same mechanisms we've used to shut down inflammation seem to be working for COVID. We know uh, bradykinins, bradykinins and cytokines are now responsible. But of course, we need a randomized trial to be able to prove that what I'm doing is helping people. Okay, thank you, Dr. Horowitz and David for both of your introductory remarks. So now for a few questions. Um, so David, uh, why are we talking about COVID in a Lyme disease conference? Well, I, I think that Richard <laughs> really uh, gave us a good primer for that in, in that, um, uh, you know, as we're starting to learn more and more about these, these conditions, you know, inflammation is something that keeps coming back to us. Um, you actually mentioned uh, Akiko's work at Yale uh, earlier on in your introduction. We've been having long conversations with her about how we can um, really start to uh, quantify what is going on from an inflammatory point of view in these patients and, and start to get some sort of a long COVID specific biomarker um, that will allow us to characterize what we're seeing. Um, but you know, more importantly, um, when, when you don't have a roadmap for a new condition, it is so important to reach out and um, gather wisdom from other groups that have been through it, not just from a medical point of view, um, understanding the pathophysiology, understanding what is happening within the body to create the symptoms that we're seeing, but also from a patient advocacy point of view. You know, Lyme is, a, a, again, as you mentioned, Jason, it is... Um, a cohort of 
uh, patients that have experienced medical gaslighting. They have experienced not having their, their symptoms treated seriously by a lot of doctors and having conversations with patient advocacy groups um, very broadly that can give us strategies to have these symptoms taken seriously, um, to have doctors understand that, you know, this is a real thing and it's not going away. Um, it, it's just it has been so valuable and we, we have been so appreciative of all of these groups um, to be so giving of their time and so passionate in helping us um, manage solutions for long COVID patients. Thank you. Richard, so I'm sure a lot of patients uh, in our community have on, on their mind uh, whether or not Lyme patients are more susceptible to COVID-19. What do you know about this? You know, I, I was worried, Jason, initially about this because uh, we published a paper called Precision Medicine uh, looking at the MSIDS model in patients who did um, adapsone therapy, and we found that about 7% had chronic variable immune deficiency in the study, 20% uh, had low IgG levels with immunoglobulins, and about 80% had subclass deficiencies in subclasses one and three. So I was initially worried because we see these immune deficiencies. We've tested patients for natural killer cells and T cells and found in some of these patients they're low. Um, some of our patients have adrenal dysfunction. Uh, they're deficient in minerals like zinc, which you need for inflammation. They might have mitochondrial dysfunction, which affects about a third of the Lyme patients in the scientific literature. So we were worried that our Lyme population actually might do worse, um, but I've been sending out letters to my patients about making sure they're taking NAC, alpha-lipoic acid, glutathione, making sure they're on zinc. We've been giving them beta-glucan, which raises natural killer cells and T cells, and I'm happy to report that not one of my patients has ended up in the hospital. Not one has ended up on a respirator. So I, I think that those who have the risk factors for COVID, hypertension, obesity, uh, cancer, immunodepression, diabetes, um, African-American, Hispanic, all the classical risk factors they've been finding, those people would theoretically be at risk. But what it's been shown is, again, it's due to inflammation as we've been talking about. So I think there are, again, ways we can modulate this. And in the second paper that I published on COVID and medical hypothesis on three novel uh, diagnostic treatment and prevention options, we've been using ivermectin. And I've treated now about 25 patients using ivermectin, doxycycline, and zinc. And just as the patients reported within one hour of glutathione use that their dyspnea got better, patients are also reporting with ivermectin based on body weight that they're feeling better. So I think there are solutions out there. There are about five or six studies now on ivermectin, many about inflammation. So uh, the Lyme patients could be at risk, but fortunately we haven't seen it so far. Okay, great. Um, David, so you know, going back to this interdisciplinary world that we're living in to try to quickly decode COVID-19, what do you think COVID researchers can learn from Lyme researchers? Oh, I, I think a lot. Um, uh, I think that definitely um, as we start to approach the idea of research um, as opposed to intervention, um, we, you know, there are a lot of things that we need to think about in terms of how do you measure something in terms of symptom intensity, in terms of symptom frequency, when the symptom, uh, symptoms are so um, sporadic uh, non-specific and, uh, and variable. And, um, you know, this is something that chronic disease, uh, communities such as the Lyme disease community have been researching for many years. And, um, in addition to assisting us with research study design, uh, also assisting us with, uh, uh, you know, the correct statistical approaches to handling data sets of this nature because it's very, very different from a clear-cut sort of uh, interventional trial where you can measure an impairment very, very clearly and see what the effect of an intervention is on the impairment. This is, this is a different animal. Uh, this is not something that we uh, typically interact with in my field. And so working with, with uh, the Lyme disease community uh, to uh, structure research in a way that is actionable and um, pragmatic and meaningful is super important for us. So same question to Dr. Horowitz. So what do you think 
COVID research, the COVID research community might learn from, from Lyme re researchers. So, um, yes, thank you. So, for example, what David was talking about earlier about the long haulers, what we found having seen uh, 13,000 patients in 30 years is I developed a model called the MSIDS model. It's got 16 different factors. And usually when we look at Lyme patients and try and figure out why they're remaining ill, we find chronic infections. Uh, we find environmental toxins that might be causing inflammation, microbiome issues, uh, low zinc, um, the palpitations and dizziness they're complaining of. We see that in POTS patients with dysautonomia, uh, that about 40% of our chronic patients get dysautonomia. So where I think we can learn from it is that it's not like we were learning in the 1800s, there may be one cause for one disease with Cox postulates. We're finding in 21st century medicine, there may be multifactorial etiologies driving inflammation with downstream effects, like affecting the hormones, the adrenals, low testosterone we see in men who are young with Lyme disease, uh, POTS dysautonomia, mitochondrial dysfunction, even psychiatric issues. So I think that model we've been using, I think is applicable. And I would love for someone who's looking at these COVID long haulers uh, to apply the model because we published it a couple of years ago in 200 patients. Uh, it's a small number, but it's been representative of what we've been seeing. So I, th I think we can learn from it and it would be fascinating in fact, to do those kind of studies. So to, to conclude, I'd like to give you each a final word, David. So uh, my final word is, I just really want everyone to acknowledge that this is a very real condition. Um, I want us not to repeat the mistakes of the past with medical gaslighting, denial of symptoms. Long COVID is real, it's here to stay. And do not let the presence of negative diagnostic tests bar people from getting care. There are many mechanisms for negative diagnostic tests that still mean that you had COVID. Richard. Yes, I, I agree with David. We've seen negative testing in the Lyme community for decades, which is a problem. I agree, please take it seriously. There was just an article this morning that young people are showing up in the hospital with the risk factors of obesity, hypertension, diabetes. So please take care of yourself. Uh, follow the CDC guidelines on prevention and, and God bless everyone because we're all doing our best and, and we'll get through this. Richard and David, thank you for your time today. Um, I think you've provided a lot of insight for everyone. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.